to give you an idea of some of the types of forecasting problems that arise, I'm going to talk about four case studies from a, my own consulting practice, things that I've helped companies solve over the years. So the first one is uh, one of my oldest, actually, one of the my earliest consulting projects is a, a paperware company came to me wanting forecasts for hundreds of items. So this company manufactured things like paper plates and serviettes, um, the wrappers for McDonald's burgers, anything that was disposable made out of paper and used um, in, in tableware. The data was um, monthly and it could be um, have trends, it could be seasonal, there was all sorts of different things, different patterns in the data. And they had a forecasting program that they'd written in-house, but they didn't trust the results. They said they were not giving sensible forecasts and they wanted to know whether I could fix it. The program was written in COBOL, which is a very old computer language that I didn't know, um, written in the 1960s. And it made numerical calculations quite difficult. So it wasn't possible to implement any forecasting model that needed sort of things like optimization. Their programmer was an expert on COBOL, but was not had very little experience in numerical computing. And they employed no statisticians. So they wanted this program to produce forecasts completely automatically. <coughs> was, um, by the end of the course, you will actually know how to solve this. Uh, but it, you know, it's quite a challenging problem because of the um, you can't just apply any tools that are available to you in R or some other language. You have to think about how to do it in a way that avoids um, numerical optimization. The methods that they were currently using at the time that I got involved were these. Um, they gave me this list, just like this. Uh, I've no idea what happened to methods B, D, F, and J. Um, somehow or other, they were off the list. But they were very simple, things like taking the average of the last 12 months of data or the average of the last six months or fitting a straight line regression over the last 12 months or over the last six months or taking the average slope between last year's and this year's values um, over either 12 months or six months. And, and K, I never figured out what it was that they were doing. Um, so that was what that was. And I had to come up with something that was better than, than those methods. Uh, which which I did. Okay, the example number two uh, is from some work I did for the Australian government about 20 years ago, where they were trying to forecast uh, drug sales on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. So in Australia, we have a drug subsidy scheme. So when you go to the pharmacy or the chemist um, to buy your prescription medication, uh, often it's at a cheaper rate than... Um, than it actually costs because the government is paying a subsidy. Uh, so you pay some of the money and then the pharmacy will get the rest of the money from, from the government. So the cost to the government depends on how many um, different types of drugs are purchased. Uh, and they don't know that uh, until, of course, after people go to the chemist. So they have to forecast total sales of all the different types of drugs. It's a hugely expensive part of the federal budget. It's about 1% of GDP. That was about 1% then, and it's still about 1% now. And the total, so the total cost that has to be put into the budget is based on forecasts. At the time that they came to ask me about how to, whether I could help with this problem, they were having serious difficulties in underestimating the total cost um, so this was this is actually a screen capture of what the ABC uh, news website looked at the time, which um, apart from telling you about the PBS budget blowout, but also shows you how bad websites were back then. But you can see that the budget had blown out by almost eight hundred million dollars in that year, which is and that was the second year in a row that that sort of underestimate had occurred. So that was that's a huge amount of money for the government to find. So at the time, 2001, the budget was about four and a half billion dollars. They were under forecasting it by about 800 million. So a huge percentage underestimate. 
there were thousands of products that was seasonal demand. Uh, some drugs uh, sell more at some times of the year than others because of the seasonality of disease, but also because of the way the drugs were subsidised that incentivized people to buy drugs more at some times of the year than others. In Australia, drugs that are on the PBS cannot be marketed explicitly, um, but they are subject to lots of covert marketing. So someone will, a drug company will produce a new drug, they're not allowed to advertise directly, so they will um, put out an advert uh, saying, you know, do you have rheumatoid arthritis? Ask your doctor about new medications. Uh, so the drug name was never mentioned, but people with that illness would then go to the doctor and ask about new medications. And so they were sort of covertly marketing it. Um, and the government would sometimes take products off the scheme so that they were no longer subsidized or they would put drugs back on the scheme and they would sometimes flip backwards and forwards. Sometimes there'd be new products for a particular disease type that would then take off because they were successful treatments and so on. The, um, the government uh, department that was responsible for this back in 2001 had data for about 10 years, monthly data. So yeah, that's 120 observations. That's pretty good. You can build a model with that. Um, but they weren't sure how to deal with seasonality. So they were aggregating it to annual level, annual data. So then you're down to only about 10 observations. And then for some reason that I never quite understood, they were not using the most recent seven years of data and only using the first three years of data and then just using the forecast function in Excel, which fits a straight line. So fitting a straight line to three years of data, seven years old, crazy. Um, and so they called me up and said, do you think you can help? And when I realized what they were doing, I said, yes, I can help because it didn't really matter what I did, it was going to be better than that. Uh, and later in the book, we'll learn about the tools that we developed for this project that have ended up being very commonly used in forecasting in other contexts as well. My third example is a car fleet company, one of Australia's largest fleet companies. And they came to me saying that they would like to have a model for forecasting the resale value of vehicles. Um, so they would, they would buy vehicles, they would lease them out for a few years, and then they would sell them. And they wanted to be able to forecast the resale value so that they could um, think about how that might affect their sales policy. Like, should they buy certain types of cars? Should they sell them after three years or five years? Um, how is it going to affect the leases and so on? They had a lot of good data, um, data on you know, what type of vehicle it was, how big the engine was, what was the transmission? Um, yeah, what color of vehicle it was, where they bought it, where they sold it, and so on. Um, and so lots of good data, which meant I could probably build a reasonably good model. Uh, one issue with this consulting project was that the, the process that the company used at the time to estimate or to forecast resale values was a group of specialists. They were experts and they would sit down and they would come up with these estimates. And when the company asked me to get involved, this group saw me as a threat and refused to cooperate. So that's another thing that sometimes happens in forecasting. You have to uh, be able to interact with people that may not always be friendly to you. And my fourth example is from an airline company that no longer exists. So this is Ansett Airlines that actually went broke about a year after I was involved. Uh, nothing to do with my forecasts. Uh, so I can, I can talk freely about the company at least because it no longer exists. Um, so they came to me and they wanted forecasts of weekly passenger numbers on all city pairs in Australia um, by class of passenger. So here's an example of one of the time series. So this is thousands of passengers um, over time and uh, actually that's that should be total number not thousands um, and you can see that there's some weird stuff going on here so this bit here that was a pilot strike where there was no passengers flying at all anywhere in Australia for quite a few weeks uh, in the late 1980s and then you get these 
these spikes occurring like here, here, here. Um, so sudden drops uh, in, in passengers, you also get some spikes. Uh, the spikes are often associated with events, like it might be a big sporting event, the Australian Grand Prix or the um, Australian Open Tennis or the uh, Grand Final, AFL Grand Final and so on. You get school holidays and the school holidays are not the same in different states. Uh, some interesting stuff going on at this end. So here's a period here where some economy class passenger seats were reclassified as business class. Um, and so there was fewer economy class seats for sale. And then after a while, they decided that wasn't a good idea and they went back to the way it used to be. So that's why it um, goes back up to this level up here. So lots and lots of things going on with the data. And it's weekly data, uh, which is problematic because there's not the same, there's not an integer number of weeks in the year. It's a little bit more than 52 weeks. So it's quite hard to model the seasonality for this type of data. And, and another problem with this particular problem is that I was never sure that I actually got the real data. Um, so this was back in the, as you can see from the dates, this was back in the early 1990s, so pre-internet. And uh, so to give me the data, they had to provide it to me on a, on a floppy disk. And um, just before they gave it to me, they said that we've got a problem. We're not allowed to give you any data because you're not an employee of the company. And I said, well, I can't. I can't do any work for you unless you give me data. And they said, well, we have a solution. What about we multiply the data by a constant and we don't tell you what the constant is? And I said, that'll work because it just means that the whole thing's scaled up or down. I will still build the same model and they can scale my forecast back um, based on the constant. So when they gave me the data on the floppy disk, I said, here you go, we've, we've, here's the data. Um, scaled by a constant and just between you and me the constant is close to one so i think probably they did give me the real data but i could never be quite sure um, the problem that they had was how to forecast passenger traffic on major routes they had lots of good data they had a really capable team of people who were able to do the computing they just needed some ideas about what sort of models would work best um, and as i said the traffic's affected by things like school holidays and on pre-advertising campaigns, competition behavior. There was actually a, comp a, a cut price airline introduced during this period and then it went bust. Uh, so, you know, that behavior, that's, that's in the data there and so on. So there's, there's some things to figure out how to put into the model uh, in order to, to be able to produce good forecasts. Okay, so there's my examples. And uh, hopefully by the uh, end of, the course, by the end of the book, you will have an idea how to solve these types of problems.